What's up my comic comrades? Since September 2020, we have periodically been working our way through the histories of the greatest heroes and anti-heroes of the pulp comic era. We started with the Phantom, then moved on to the one and only Dick Tracy, and then more recently, the iconic dark hero, The Shadow. Every episode has been a crap ton of fun, and exploring these characters really makes you realize how big of an impact they've had on characters like Batman, The Question, and other fan-loved characters. With that in mind, today we're giving the Green Hornet center stage. This is another extremely overlooked character who has even had crossover titles with Batman. So let's take a look at this under appreciated hero. Hornet first appeared on the Green Hornet radio program on January 31st of 1936 and was created by George W. Trendle and Fran Stryker. Now, while he debuted on a radio show, he did also make his first comic book appearance in Green Hornet Comics issue one in December of 1940. But overall, this dude predates Superman. The Green Hornet radio show first aired on WXYZ in Detroit, the Mutual Network, and on NBC Blue. One of the most fun and interesting aspects of the Green Hornet's creation is that writers Trendle and Stryker were also the creators of the Lone Ranger. So as a fun twist, they made the Green Hornet a distant relative of the Lone Ranger, specifically his grandnephew. So you can throw that one in your trivia bucket, but now let's get into the Green Hornet's comic book fictional origin. We get a perfect retelling of the Green Hornet's origin in Matt Wagner's The Green Hornet Year One series published through Dynamite. First and foremost, The Green Hornet is a period piece as we see the story takes place in Chicago in the early 1920s. In issue one of the Year One comic, we see a young Britt Reed looking at his father's insect collection as his dad is on the phone discussing business. We learn his dad, Daniel Reed, is a rich newspaper editor for the Daily Sentinel. Once he gets off the phone, he grabs his son's shoulder saying, I see you staring at these a lot, son. What do you think of them? Britt replies, I guess I'm scared of them. His dad gets down on one knee saying, oh no, you shouldn't fear insects. They are simply some more of God's creations. There's nothing evil about them. Brett responds, but they appear so strange and dangerous. His dad tells him, and yes, some of them are, but so are many people. Insects that bite or sting are only acting in self-defense, usually to protect themselves or their territory. That's all very natural. Why, it's the same way I would respond if I had to defend either you or your mother or our home. Brett points to one saying, but what about that one? His dad responds, oh, well, that's a rather unique and aggressive African species. Trust me, Brett, what I just told you is true, but if you ever encounter one of those, you'd be wisest to run in the opposite direction. As we see, it's a green Hornet. The comic then brings us to Osaka, where we see a young boy training with his father in the way of the samurai. As the father says to him, integrity, courage, charity, respect, honesty, honor, and loyalty, before knocking his son's helmet off with his sword. He extends his hand to his son, saying, even though we samurai no longer hold the same venerable role in modern Japan, ours is an august legacy. Embrace and embody these ideals, my son, and one day you'll bring pride to the name Hayashi Kato as his son bows, telling us this is clearly a young Kato training with his dad. For the few unaware, Kato becomes the Green Hornet's sidekick. After this, the issue jumps to the future, where we see Green Hornet and Kato stopping some thugs beating up two guys with a baseball bat. Then it brings us right back to Chicago in 1926, where Brit is now older as he visits his dad at the Sentinel. He tells his dad, I won the track meet again, dad. I mean, our team won, but I scored the most points. Daniel says, wonderful lad, but how about your academics? How is your reading comprehension and composition? Britt answers, fine, I guess. His dad tells him, athletics are well and good, but a man's mind is the key to his success. He continues to say, look, I am proud of your achievements, Britt, but I also know what it's going to take for you to someday succeed me here as publisher of the Sentinel. Britt responds, I don't, I mean, yes, sir, I'll try harder, with his father saying, out of boy. The comic then brings us to Osaka in 1926, where we see Kato shopping at a fish market with his father. He tells her when your mother was alive, she used to love picking out the evening's fish, even though we were wealthy enough to have servants and a marvelous cook. I like to continue this tradition in her honor. Right after this, we learn Kato's mom died from a sickness. We then see the Japanese military arrive saying, citizens of the great nation, all males of legal age are eligible for glorious service in the Imperial Army. By enlisting, you will bring great honor on your family and yourself. But Kato's dad just rushes him away, wanting his son to have nothing to do with them, saying their leader goals are not honorable, essentially telling his son some masters are more deserving than others. The comic gives us another time jump in Chicago, the year 1934, where we see Daniel asking his son, but why, Brit? He replies, Dad, I just feel like I have to experience more than the life I've always known. I want to see the world, all of it. His dad replies, but what about the Sentinel? There's such important work for you to do here at home. He tells his dad, oh, come off it, Dad. You mean like bringing down organized crime? I've got a flash for you. All your valiant efforts against the mob haven't done a lick of good. They're still here and they're not going anywhere. He then immediately apologizes saying, I'm sorry, Dad. I shouldn't have said that. His dad says, no, you're right. I've been a fool to try to cage you behind a desk at such a young age. Good luck, son, and don't forget to write. He tells his dad, come on, I'm the son of a newspaper man. And with that, Britt went to travel the world and help people in any way he can in the process. Then back in Osaka in the same year, we see Kato come to his dad in a military uniform with his dad saying, so it has finally come to this. He tells his father, I'm sorry, father, but I cannot ignore my duty to serve my country and my emperor. This recent conscription is necessary for the ongoing conflict with China. I wish things were different. He then gets up and says, as do I, my son, 
regardless of where feet may lead you, I am certain you will agree to the rising sun with honor and integrity. May the gods protect you, son. Now this obviously sets the stage for Brit and Cato to eventually meet one another. You see, Brit eventually realized that the world is pretty damn evil and ultimately became trapped in China due to the Imperial Japanese army attacking them. Meanwhile, Cato turns on his commander and fellow soldiers, realizing their intentions aren't good. Dude literally slashes down his commanding officer with a sword, but eventually is captured by his fellow soldiers who are like, bro, you're a turncoat, AKA a traitor. Now you're gonna die as they line him up to shoot him. But good old Brit sees this happening and surprises all of them to the back of the head with a two by four saving Kato. This obviously resulted in the two of them becoming good friends. Kato even offered to be Brit's protector for saving his life. Kato would inevitably travel back to America with Brit in issue four of the series. However, once they return to America on the very last page of the issue, Brit sees a headline on the front of the Daily Sentinel saying, Crusading publisher passes away. Sentinel owner succumbs to fatal stroke. Obviously, this devastates Brit, but he doesn't have time for grieving as he now has to take over his father's newspaper. And he intends to do what his father wanted to do, bring down crime in the city of Chicago, but realizes doing it through his father's method via the newspaper is not going to work after he gets a threatening call from a mobster telling him he needs to reconsider the Daily Sentinel's editorial direction. That his reporters need to stop poking their noses where they don't belong. Angered, Cato asks, what's wrong? As he slams the phone down. Brit says, everything, Cato. This town, the mob, the whole rotten system. How do truth and justice stand a chance against brutality and vice? Law Laws are subverted, influence is bought, even the press is subject to intimidation. There's just got to be another way to fight these bastards. Kato tells them there is a way. In Japan, when conventional methods have failed, there's another manner of defeating one's enemies. Striking from the shadows. Then in issue six of the series, we see Kato train Brit in the ways of martial arts. And ultimately, Brit takes on a fearsome mask or identity, the Green Hornet, which his father warned him about when he was a child saying, you'd be wise to run away from one if you ever saw one. And Kato would be his trusty sidekick slash driver. And just like that, you have the origin of Green Hornet. And speaking of trusty sidekicks, we're stoked about today's sponsor, Incogni. You ever wish you had invisibility? How about online invisibility for your personal information? I definitely do. Why? Because thousands of companies are collecting, aggregating, and trading your personal data without you knowing anything about it. Like your name, email, gender, home address, relatives, phone number, education, IP information, aliases, social security number, employment history, shopping habits. It's a lot. But the good news is you have the right to request that data brokers delete the information they have about you and protect your privacy. It would take you years to do it by yourself, and that's where Incogni comes in. They can contact all those data brokers on your behalf and request they take all that information down. Immediately after signing up for myself, Incogni found a ton of brokerage firms that had my information, and they got to work on getting my info scrubbed from those lists. I don't know about you, but I'm so sick of signing up for a free newsletter and then getting a load of spam from unknown senders. Or when I do a quick Google search on myself and seeing my home address and phone number is available for anyone who pay for it. It's freaking ridiculous. But thankfully, you can start to clean all of it up with Incogni. Right now, the first 100 people to use the code variant at the link below will get 20% off Incogni service. So protect your privacy today. Be among those first 100 people to get 20% off by going to incogni.com forward slash variant and use code variant to take your personal data off the market. Now, first and foremost, I think the go-to Green Hornet story, especially for new readers, should be Matt Wagner's Green Hornet Year One 12 issue miniseries, which I briefly just went over in our origin segment. But of course, you also have the original 1940s Green Hornet comics. These are golden age classics for true comic fans that will stand the test of time. I mean, Jack Kirby and Joe Simon did a lot of art for them, the kings of the comic book world. But even besides that, they're the books that pulled from the Green Hornet radio show, cementing the Green Hornet's most iconic traits, characteristics, and backstory. Actually, a lot of the 1940s Green Hornet comic stories were just adaptations of the stories we heard from the radio show. Then we also have the 1989 Green Hornet 14 issue miniseries, which is basically just like a whole history information dump of Green Hornet in one series. Heck, on the very first page of the first issue, we see the Green Hornet's relation to the Lone Ranger. It starts with an old Brit Reed writing memoirs and his family genealogy. The series even gives us the Reed family tree as well as the Cato family tree, breaking down all the different Green Hornets and relations. That's right, there hasn't been just one Green Hornet. It's kind of like the Phantom. It's a mantle handed down each generation. It's another series that's easy for newcomers to Green Hornet to jump into because there's literally graphs explaining everything, plus the stories are just classic fun Green Hornet. Then in more recent years, Dynamite Entertainment has been publishing Green Hornet books and we've gotten some great ones, like again, Green Hornet Year One. You also have the 2010 Green Hornet series by Dynamite. This is actually the series that brought Green Hornet back in a big way. This and Green Hornet Year One. This was like the first big ongoing series for Green Hornet in a long time and it was kicked off by the great Kevin Smith who wrote the first seven issues. And fun fact about Kevin Smith, his run on the book is actually the comic book version of his unproduced 
produced screenplay for his Green Hornet film, which is awesome. So if you ever wondered what Kevin Smith's Green Hornet film was going to be like, this comic is literally it. And let me tell you, I wish they would have picked this film up because it would have been infinitely better than that Seth Rogen one we got. And that's the only mention of Seth Rogen Green Hornet film we're going to talk about because quite frankly, I think we all wish that film didn't happen. Then we have the 2013 Green Hornet where we see Brit become egotistical and arrogant. So much so he became an out of control social crusader that became way too sure of himself and of his judgment. This eventually leads him to go too far and because of this, an innocent bystander pays the ultimate horrible price, which puts the legend of the Green Hornet in danger. You also have the 2010 Green Hornet series, which lasted 33 issues. There's also the fantastic and fun Batman 66 meets the Green Hornet 12 issue miniseries by yet again, Kevin Smith and Ralph Garman with art by the great Ty Templeton. This is an insanely fun read that basically gives us an extended version of that Batman Green Hornet 66 crossover a lot of us remember so fondly from the TV series. Essentially, Batman and Robin have to team up with Green Hornet and Kato to stop a mutual enemy. All in all, to some people's shock, there is a ton of Green Hornet story arcs and titles. I mean, the character's been around since 36, so don't worry, I'll give you a bunch of reading recommendations later. But I want to shift gears a bit before we move on to powers and abilities and mention the 66 Green Hornet TV series. This show was a cult classic and had a big audience at the time. In fact, it was so popular, Green Hornet got a crossover with the 66 Batman TV series, which I briefly just mentioned. And that crossover resonated with so many fans that it was revisited in comic book form decades later by Kevin Smith and Ralph Garman. Now, even though the Green Hornet series was generally loved, it only lasted for 26 episodes. It starred Van Williams as Green Hornet and the one and only Bruce Motherfreaking Lee as Kato. That's right, Bruce Lee played a superhero and even teamed up with Batman and Robin. How crazy is that? But with that said, let's move on to powers and abilities. I briefly alluded to it earlier, but the mantle of Green Hornet is just that, a mantle that's passed down from generation to generation. Because of this, there has been several different Green Hornets, such as Britt Reed, the first, Britt Reed the second, Alan Reed, Paul Reed, Gordon Reed, and Clayton Reed. But with that said, all are more or less have the same powers and or abilities. And I'm here to tell you it's not really that extensive. The Green Hornet has three main traits. Genius level intellect, he is extremely intelligent, which obviously gives him a massive upper hand. He's also an expert detective, one of the best comics has to offer. Though when you think of greatest detectives in comics, you immediately think of Batman, The Question, Rorschach, Jessica Jones, Detective Chimp, and so on. But Green Hornet should be lumped in there as well. And lastly, he is a very skilled martial artist and combatant. Being trained by Kato, he was quite literally deadly with his hands. As far as gadgets go, Green Hornet most notably uses his gas gun. As the name suggests, it releases gas which can subdue or knock out his opponents. I'll tell you right now, I got a short list of people that don't need a gun to release a deadly gas. Tim's right there. As for Kato, he uses throwing darts that look like a hornet. Then of course the Green Hornet has his Black Beauty, which is an enhanced car. The Black Car has all sorts of gadgets built in, like machine guns, flamethrowers, stinger missiles, anti-riot spikes. Think of it like the Batmobile before the Batmobile. With that said though, let's move on to some reading recommendations. If you're looking for some good Green Hornet reading recommendations, check out Dynamite's 2010 Green Hornet series, the original 1940s Green Hornet comic series, Batman 66 meets the Green Hornet, Green Hornet Reign of the Demon, and lastly, Green Hornet Strikes. That should be more than enough to get you all started. And that's gonna bring today's episode to a close, but if you like that video, be sure to check out this one right here, and if you like all of our content, be sure to like, subscribe, and comment, it helps us out. But other than that, I'll see you next time when I talk about all things comics.